There you go. So, uh, sleep mastery during stressful times. Uh, I'm Anthony Harcher. For those that haven't ha- haven't met me, uh, a cl- clinical nutritionist and lifestyle medicine specialist. A little bit about me. Um, I'm a family man. Uh, my wife Adriana here on your right. Uh, Sophia in the middle at the front, and little Ollie at the back. Uh, my journey has been uh, one of, I guess, a corporate background. So I started out as a chemical engineer and did 15 years in the workspace, uh, doing all sorts of different roles, um, ended up in global project management, and then decided I really wanted to pursue my passion. That thing was burning in my heart for so long, and that's uh, health and wellness, and I love helping others. So I married the two together, went back to school, and did eight years of further study, and ended up with a Bachelor of Complementary Medicine and a degree in Nutrition and Dietetic Medicine. And today I'm doing what I'm most passionate about, and that's you know empowering others to uh, make better decisions around their health. So really hoping you get a lot out of today's session on sleep mastery. Uh, so what we're going to cover today is certainly a discussion around how important the day is, what you do during the day. It's not just about the night. Uh, the day has a massive uh, effect on how we sleep at night. Uh, So we need to manage the day successfully in order to have a successful night's sleep. The next one is on natural light. Um, It's, you know, you think, uh, you know, it's uh, it's probably a given, but uh, we actually don't see a lot of natural light uh, with our lifestyles today. We're, you know, transporting to work or if we're at home, we're at home, we stay in the home, we work in home. Uh, We're not outside a lot. Uh, and we'll certainly design to see a lot more sunlight and natural light. And particularly if you're in office spaces or you know home working environments where you don't have natural light, you know it's just artificial light all day. And I'm going to explain why this is important. I'll be certainly covering the diet and you know what you can do with your diet to help your sleep. Uh, there's certain micro and macronutrients that are really beneficial uh, for good sleep. And there's the obvious one around movement. I'll certainly be sharing why that is important and taking regular breaks throughout the day. So uh, these are the areas I'll be covering throughout the presentation. I'll have a QA and a at the end. Uh, so hold your questions for the end and looking forward to um, empowering you on sleep. Uh, so I think it's important to have that level of awareness of why you're doing certain things, uh, well, and certainly that understanding of why what I'm talking about is so important. And so I'm gonna just talk a bit more about the why and why you should be doing certain things. Uh, So here's a a graph uh, of how our cortisol, which is a stress hormone, uh, and what its levels are in a, I guess, a natural way or in a, you know, in a, say a normal person. Um, and this is very much the cortisol mapped over what you've probably heard of the circadian rhythm. So the circadian rhythm is that night day cycle. So you can see here cortisol starts rising in the morning. And so by mid morning, we should be feeling very alert and awake and ready for action. And ideally our op- optimal productivity should be around mid morning. Now, if you don't experience this and you have low cortisol in the morning, uh, your cortisol is not aligned with the circadian rhythm and there's a shift that's happened and you know it, you can get that shift back. However, you know you should be waking, feeling refreshed, ready to go and ready to tackle the day. If you're not, it's probably why you're on this call, you know, on this uh, webinar today. Uh, so, This cycle, yeah, peaks mid-morning and then starts declining in the afternoon. And hence why we have this afternoon slump. Uh, So that's natural. So if you do experience that slump after lunch, you know, 2, 3, um, 4 p.m., then that's completely normal. Uh, You know, our cortisol is really declined significantly from the mid-morning. And then it should be gradually declining all the way to where it bottoms out around 10 p.m. So that's for someone that's got a a normal circadian rhythm and their cortisol is functioning well. Uh, If if you don't experience what I've shown you here, then obviously, uh, you know, there's a shift in your cortisol production and it's not working 
in alignment with the circadian rhythm. Uh, this other graph also um, shares with a couple of other uh, important you know, hormones and other factors, such as if you look at the red line here, again, this is mapped over the, the day night and you know, starting at um, the, you know, 12 and working your way all the way to midnight. Uh, so our core body temperature is here and it drops you know, throughout the night and you know, in the early hours of the morning, it's at its lowest point. And that's where majority of people sort of pass away uh, is, you know, when they have, I guess, low uh, plasma cortisol, low body temperature, everything's just ready to pack it in. Um, in terms of the melatonin, as you can see here, it starts rising at around, you know, that sort of 9, 10 p.m. And that's when we really want to be ready for sleep because uh, it's, this rise until the peak is when we get our best sleep. Uh, so this sort of, you know, 10 p.m. to around 2, 3 a.m. is when we get our optimal sleep. It's where we do our most of our repair and regeneration. And if you're not getting to bed before midnight, then you're missing out on some of that important time, uh, that valuable sleep time. Uh, so certainly the technique I will be sharing with you today will cover how you can get back into this circadian rhythm and how you can get a good night's sleep. One of the key factors that shift our cortisol production, and that's what I mentioned before, is the stress hormone, and if that's out of rhythm. Uh, you know, so for example, for some people, cortisol is rising in the evening when they should be going to sleep, and that's a real problem. When you have cortisol rising, your body is not, is not going to produce melatonin because they cancel each other out. Melatonin helps us to put, to put us to sleep. Cortisol is that awakening um, response. So what we need to do in order to you know, get that circadian rhythm back working for us, we need to manage the cortisol. And we do that through managing our stress. Uh, so these are the core factors of what drives stress. There's those emotional factors such as fear and anger, and there's you know probably a, a quite a bit of this with the uncertainty that, that's around at the moment. A lot of fear, you know, uncertain about the future. Then there's the poor diet. So the typical Western diet is very inflammatory. Uh, you know, inflammatory body will result in uh, you know infl inflamed mind, uh, and we we don't produce the right balance and neurotransmitters. To function well. Uh, you know, excessive exercise is also not great. Uh, excessive all, uh, exercise will raise cortisol. Uh, so, you know, if you're doing a, a HIIT session 9 p.m. at night, um, yes, you, you'll take another probably up to three hours to fall asleep uh, because it elevates your cortisol. Uh, so the timing of when you do things is important. The lack of sleep um, will elevate cortisol um, uh, so that you know it, it, it's this vicious cycle you know you're not getting good sleep and therefore you struggle with doing the right things the next day because typically the next day what will you go for you'll go through for these stimulants such as you know caffeine um, you know having coffee throughout the day to get you by will then affect your night so um, caffeine stimulates cortisol production and then lastly is environmental factors. So environmental factors such as, you know, air pollution, um, you know, there's mold, uh, the, the toxins generated from mold. There's EMF, uh, electromagnetic frequencies, you know, from our phones, uh, microwaves, uh, radio waves, all these things are stresses on the body. Um, also, you know, eating out of plastics, you know, we're putting in chemical chemicals into our body that, uh, not supportive of our body and our body needs to get rid of them. Uh, so that creates inflammation uh, and causes stress. So, so here are some of the factors. Now, what can we do about these factors? Um, I guess what I'm doing here uh, in this slide is just showing you how to manage this seesaw. Uh, so there's certain things that will push the cortisol up and there's certain things that will push it down. And ultimately, we want to get balanced. Cortisol is not evil. Uh, cortisol is required. Uh, it's just needed, like anything, in balance. Um, so 
the uppers I mentioned quite elaborately before, so I won't you know touch on this in detail. But certainly, you know, have, having a lot of deadlines, so always pursuing a deadline, always trying to meet a deadline, will elevate cortisol. Uh, constantly negative thoughts, self sabotage um, is going to affect uh, cortisol production. Uh, you know, anything that results in fear. Um, uh, and then, yeah, I mentioned the others. So in terms of what we can do to bring our cortisol down, so to balance the seesaw, so to bring, you know, to bring it down so it's balanced, is um, we need to look at things that are in our control and focus on what we can control. You know, so in the, the current circumstances, uh, some people are in industries that they can't, Control. They have jobs in that industry um, that, you know, it's up to the, the company whether they're going to lose their job. They can't control that. All, all as they can control is how they respond to that situation. So it's important that we go to things of control. I'm going to talk a lot more about this in subsequent slides around finding your routine and in doing that routine on a consistent basis because that puts you back in the driver's seat when you stick with a routine and you enact that routine. Light to moderate exercise is certainly going to help manage the cortisol. Uh, yes, we do need some high intensity training, but we need to do it at the right time of the day. Uh, it's important um, and we don't want to be doing excessive amounts of it. You know, you don't, we don't need to do high intensity interval training six days a week. Uh, you know, one day a week is perfectly uh, good for us. Um, you know, nature, and I think this is part of society today, is that we're all, we have this all or nothing approach. Uh, so someone, we hear that HIIT training is good for us. You know, HIIT training is fantastic for weight loss, for example. So we go out and just smash ourselves six days a week, uh, seven days a week. Um, and we don't seem to do anything in moderation. Um, and these shifts in our, you know, these dramatic shifts in our behavior, such as, you know, I'm going to do the keto diet and you drop everything overnight and you switch to this diet. That's a big stress on the body. Uh, it's a big stress emotionally as well. Um, so because of this all or nothing approach, you know, and it's very much driven by our environment because keeping up with the Joneses, everyone's doing it. Uh, that really, it shifts the body and the body takes time to find the balance and try to help you out and support you. So, we don't want to have this radical, this significant shift um, of behaviour. You know, we want to keep our lives um, well, more supportive. So, you know, if we're looking to step out of our comfort zone, we don't do a huge jump and a huge leap. You know, you're best to do bite-sized pieces. And uh, so certainly not significant shifts in your lifestyle. Uh, and some are unavoidable. You know, I acknowledge that. Uh, and hence why I'm going to give you some strategies to help cope with these unavoidable situations. Uh, but, you know, things that are in our control, like diet, you know, doing radical diets um, aren't, aren't, aren't going to support your health. It's actually going to produce a stress. Um, uh, so nature is very calming and with our, the way in which we live our lives today is very disconnected from nature. You know, we live in cities. Um, we're not really surrounded by nature. Uh, you know, we rarely interact with nature. And so really making an effort to embrace nature is, is calming. As you know, when you get to the beach, how calming that is. Uh, that's what nature does. The minute you walk uh, into bushland, how calming that is. Um, you know, when we go camping, how calming that is. Um, I've got the next point is interacting with pets is calming. It's relaxing. So when you pat your cat or dog, um, that is calming of the, for the nervous system. It's bringing down cortisol. Uh, when we interact positively with friends and loved ones, that is calming. It's not the fights and arguments, but it's certainly the, you know, the, the pleasant interactions. Uh, hanging out with people that are positive and optimistic uh, is really energizing and puts you feeling that things are good and great and you're back in the driver's seat you're not living a life of fear um rest and relaxation is key we don't do that enough today uh laughter and having fun uh sometimes it's on the you know we we're doing it too much or we don't we do it too little it's you know finding that balance um 
again, mindfulness is, you know, it's sort of an all or nothing. Yes, I'm doing meditations. I'm having a break from meditation or I'm back on it. You know, doing things consistently is key. Um, and then the eating the comfort foods. Um, so that's um, in some ways will help regulate um, in terms of how you feel, but then overdoing it, it's not great. It's getting that extreme. So uh, um, it is finding that balance. And we're going to talk more about how, how you find the balance in the next few slides. Uh, in terms of that last point around that, um, you know, more sort of eating comfort foods and not emotionally binge eating, a uh, good practice is certainly mindfulness. And a good practice to really set your night up is doing uh, regular acts of mindfulness throughout the day. Because that way you're regulating your cortisol throughout the day so that you don't have to do this massive shift of cortisol in the evening if it's elevated. So, you know, if you're working right up until 7 p.m. at night, your body's just been going, 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 and the cortisol's been elevated because uh, you've been trying to meet a deadline or whatever, um, or you're trying to meet your own personal deadlines. Um, that's really going to implicate your ability to fall asleep at 10 p.m. Uh, so we want to be having adequate breaks. Yes, so we can still be very productive uh, throughout the day, uh, but it's just you know factoring in adequate breaks throughout the day, and that can be like taking time out to do some exercise during the day. Uh, it can be just taking a pause. Um, and I particularly recommend you do this when someone stressed you out heavily, uh, because what you don't want is to take that event onto the next interaction. So you may be catching up with a friend. You take that frustration, that anger to that meeting with that friend, and then that next interaction is affected. So. What you really want to be doing after an interaction that's not so great or after some news is not so great is to really embrace a form of mindfulness. I've listed a few here, but by really embracing what works for you uh, will help you just regulate that stress and make you more calmer, make you make, it'll help make rational decisions. You know, when we're stressed, we make irrational decisions. Uh, so really calming the nervous system when we get uptight about something. And so it's really embracing, and it could be a combination of these. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot more forms of mindfulness. It's whatever brings you into the here and now. Uh, you may have, you know, some people, you know, playing a game of chess or something um, may work for them. Throwing some darts or playing a bit of snooker or something like that. Um, it's, you know, bouncing a basketball. You know, it's whatever works for you, whatever just takes you into the present moment. It doesn't have to be meditation. Uh, so here's some ideas for what you, how you could segment your day so that you have sufficient rest uh, and you can regulate that cortisol so it's not elevated in the evening. So morning exercise, you know, is really recommended in the sense that it doesn't then get pushed uh, out uh, because something else comes up. In the morning is you own that time of the day. Uh, it's totally in your control. Uh, it's, you know, as the day goes on, we've got more and more demands as the day goes on. Uh, in the morning, it's our time. We should, uh, you know, we should really appreciate that time and do things that are going to nourish us. So I don't, you know, suggest you wake up in the morning and look at your phone because there'll be demands on there. There'll be emails that you'll read that are demanding your attention and time. Uh, and there could be things that change your emotions like you wake up you feeling you know you could feel refreshed but then the minute you open your phone you see a, a post that's not so nice or a comment that's not so nice or whatever it may be that really just shifts your mindset uh, immediately and you're straight away in that reactive that uh, impulsive uh, that you know not you know not rational sort of behavior mode uh, so Getting up, not looking at your phone, doing things that are going to nurture you. Uh, you know, some people, morning exercise just doesn't work for them. They don't, they don't you know, have that um, energy or they don't like invigorating themselves in the morning. Uh, so, you know, for them, I suggest them to do more uh, things such as maybe go for a walk. You know, if you've got a park nearby, just do a nice loop around the park, get outside, enjoy the outdoors, connect with nature. Or maybe just 
owning that time and really sitting down and having a nourishing breakfast with a cup of tea um, and just really just enjoying that space um, before, you know, the activity starts, you know, before you need to go to work or before the meetings start. Uh, and so this morning tea is, is one way in which we can, you know, gain certainty uh, because we're in control uh, and to really get us more into the driver's seat as opposed to feeling out of the driver's seat um, because of certain events or situations. You know, there'll be obviously during the day, there'll be stressful events that come up, pop up, stressful news, um, whatever. Uh, but so we, you know, as I said before, we want to then realise, be aware that, you look, I'm feeling a bit wound up. Um, it's time to calm down. Uh, you know, we often see this with children. They'll get wound up and we'll tell them to take a deep breath. You know, we should take some of our advice on board and do it ourselves. Um, and, you know, sometimes that 10 second rule can be really advantageous. Uh, so if you, you know, in a meeting and someone says something that's not so kind or, you know, you think not warranted, just take 10 second pause before you respond. Collect your thoughts, collect your emotions. And that way you'll respond ration rationally uh, and you won't add fuel to the fire and you will look like someone that's in control uh, and you'll gain back the power that you may have lost through that comment. Uh, but you're not fueling them <laughs> and, and making it a clash. So it's important that you know we go for these mindfulness techniques as we get wound up throughout the day. I've mentioned here, you know, a luncheon, you know, getting outside, having lunch in the park or going, meeting someone else for lunch or just you could do your active, you know, your active, you know, if you're not a morning person in terms of exercise, do your exercise at lunch. Uh, in the evening is another time where we can disconnect from work and we can really take control of what we do in the evening and we can own that space and really have a nice routine, you know, and, it, you know, by having a routine, by being back in the driver's seat, it's telling the mind that everything's okay, I'm on top of this, uh, I'm not out of control. That feeling of out of control will result in anxiety. Anxiety will drive stress hormones. Uh, so we wanna collect our thoughts in the evenings um, and have a routine, which I'm gonna go through, you know, a routine that you could embrace or you could embrace aspects of it. So, I suggest you eat as early as possible, not only for the reason of helping you sleep, uh, but also for the reason of um, this principle of intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding you may have heard about. It's really beneficial. So it's allowing sufficient time for our digestive system to repair itself. You know, when we're constantly eating and nibbling and snacking, uh, it's constantly working. And so unless we rest it, uh, it can't rejuvenate itself. Uh, it, it won't assimilate nutrients pop properly. Uh, you know, it can result in this feeling of, you know, that you like bloatingness. Uh, it can re result in feelings of stomach cramps. Uh, it can really affect our bowel motions. Uh, it can, you know, cause reflux and all those sort of things. So um, it's important to have sufficient breaks and that's you know, one of the benefits as well, you know, as eating early is that we give that good break for our digestive system to repair and regenerate. Uh, and we can actually get more energized from doing that. Um, so it is important not to eat just before bed. We want to allow some time for the digestive system to break down the foods, to assimilate it um, and, you know, be ready. You know, once if we go to bed with a heavy stomach, all the energy is, is going towards digestion. Uh, you know, it's it's going to delay the production of other hormones and that, you know, that are going to help you sleep. So eating as early as possible is really beneficial for more than one reason. Um, relaxing after dinner is key. Again, it helps with digestion. Um, it helps bring down the cortisol. And so it's doing something that you like doing uh, that's relaxing for you. It's not you know, getting back to the work, getting on the computer, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, looking at social media can actually create anxiousness um, because you could be comparing yourself to that person that's, oh, you know, well, no one's holidaying at the moment. So that FOMO is not really there as much. But, um, 
you know, certainly, uh, you know, that thing of comparison can result in, you know, self-sabotage, anxious thoughts and all those sort of things. So, it, it, no, it, it certainly does pay to have a break from social media in the evening and even a break from your phone. So a good technique can be, you know, after dinner is not touching your phone. You don't touch it until after you've had your morning routine. And just having, again, like just like the digestive system needs a break, your mind needs a break. Um, uh, and, you know, looking at phone, looking at posts, social media, all that sort of stuff is stimulus for the brain. Um, starting to reduce the lighting. So melatonin production, which I showed earlier, really kicks in at 9, you know, to 10 p.m. Uh, we can delay the onset of production of melatonin, which is our sleep hormone, through having all these bright lights, looking at screens, uh, winding ourselves up um, uh, with work, or whatever it may be. Uh, so cortisol will delay the onset, you know, so elevated cortisol through being stressed or working or whatever will delay the onset of melatonin production, um, as well as lighting. So in, in order for us to produce melatonin, we need darkness. So in the evening, you want to start dimming the lights. You want to have... Uh, less of the white light, the blue light, um, uh, more of that warm warm lights, you know, lamps and things like that, um, or even no lights and just, you know, uh, lighting a candle, for example, is fantastic. Uh, so the, the earlier we can reduce our exposure to artificial lighting, the better you are in terms of starting the production of melatonin. And it's the reason why we go to bed so early when we're camping. Um, it's because we, we're surrounded in darkness. We might have a campfire or we might have a torch, but our, our you know, light receptors are just picking up darkness uh, and thinking, oh, it's night time. It's time to produce melatonin. Uh, so we can create that environment, that ambience at home, and it can be quite romantic, uh, you know, lighting a candle and having the candle burning and, and just having a, a reading light or something like that. It's really nice. Um, uh, also, during this time of you starting to wind down, you'll find because you aren't stressed, you'll start solving problems because uh, you're getting all the con neuro connections happening. You're not in that rational sort of state. You're in that more collective state, that creative state, which is you know that state of calmness. Um, and so when we're in this calm state, uh, we start solving that problem we could never solve when we're stressed. Hence, you know, while we start getting all these creative ideas when we're in the shower, because uh, water calms us, calms the nervous system. Um, so I suggest you have a notepad out whilst you're going through this nightly routine, just to jot down, you know, if you're not feeling great, just acknowledge it, really acknowledge that feeling, put it on paper, you know, start getting it out of your head. Um, and empty it onto some paper. And uh, also it, your to-do list, you know, you'll start, things will start popping in that you didn't do during the day. So it's very important to start getting that out of your head. Because if we don't get it out of our head, we manifest on it. We start thinking, oh, I must do that. If I don't call that person back, they're gonna think this, that, or this, or whatever, or I haven't got that back to my document, back to my boss, or whatever. And we just start manifesting it. And we actually take that problem to our sleep and we tend to sleep on that problem uh, and our sleep is really impaired because our brain's trying to process it. Best to get it out of the mind onto paper knowing that you're going to address that the next day when you're ready. So I really suggest you do this journaling at night time and a great way you know if the journaling has sort of reinitiated some work thoughts or reinitiated some feelings or brought up some stuff that's not so great really end that journaling on things that you are grateful for. So, you know, when we're grateful, when we have appreciation, we fall in love with the things that we currently have. And we're not worried about what we don't have. We're just totally satisfied with the world around us and what we do have. And it draws our focus to it. And what you'll find, the more you do, you know, gratitude journaling or just that act of, you know, it makes us more we appreciate what people are doing for us uh, more uh, and we get that smile back from them and that's contagious, that makes us feel good. Um, so 
what I love about it is once you start doing this journaling around gratitude is that the next day you're starting to acknowledge the small things that are happening that you'd always just overlook because you're too stressed uh, or too busy or too busy in pursuit of something else that you want that you don't have. Once we have that feeling that, you know, I, I love what I have, I'm really grateful for everything I have, or, you know, I'm grateful for certain aspects, you still might be not having everything that you want, but you acknowledge that what you do have, that acknowledgement is really helpful. And it just puts our mind at ease that, yes, everything's okay. Uh, we want to send more of these messages, everything's okay to the mind. The minute the mind feels that, it, that you know, things aren't okay is when it starts getting anxious. It's when we start producing more cortisol. It's not going to help with our sleep. Uh, part of this wind down process could incorporate a you know a magnesium bath, Epsom salts, uh, magnesium sulfate, uh, you know, with some essential oils. That can be really nice with a candlelight if you've got a bath. It's really nice. Um, so that can be a, a something you do maybe three times a night, uh, three times a week, and you know it's something to look forward to. Oh, it's my you know Epsom salt bath night. I can't wait. Uh, it's so relaxing. Um, and, you know, if you're doing bathing or showering in the evening, I find, you know, once your muscles are warmed is after that is to do some light stretching. Um, and again, it, because you're doing something physically and letting the muscles know that everything's okay, you know, muscles, you can let go of that tension, uh, time to relax. That sends a signal to the brain. And so you're sending all these acclimation, you know, all these signal things to the brain, like such as, you know, the journaling of gratitude, everything's okay, the muscles, everything's okay, all these signals are getting back to the brain that, hey, it's time to uh, relax and wind down. Uh, so that, you know, all these things are really advantageous. And the most important thing around sleep is consistency. So making sure we're working like clockwork. And for those that are parents or for those that have a pet, when you're in a routine, everything is so much easier, you know, it, whether it be for the animal or for the child. Um, it's the same as for us. There's no difference. Um, that, that routine gives us certainty. Uh, our body then responds like clockwork. And uh, so it's being consistent with the time you start your routine to the time you end your routine. So it's not, you know, tonight I'm going to bed at 10 p.m. because I've got to, you know, get up early tomorrow. It's every night I'm going to bed at 10 p.m., once you get into this routine, sleep is a dream. It's so easy because uh, our body's just used to this. It loves clockwork because um, it's able to regulate itself better when we aren't doing extreme things such as binge watching Netflix at midnight, then it's really shifting things. Um, uh, and then that shift, that one shift, that one night can catch up with us for many nights afterwards or and the days afterwards. Uh, so the more we can be consistent, the easier it is with a good night's sleep. So just onto the nutrition side of things. So how do we nourish our body to ensure it can produce such as, you know, melatonin? You know, we want to be able to produce melatonin. If our body doesn't have the resources, that being the food it needs to manufacture melatonin, then it's not going to be able to make melatonin. Um, so to make melatonin, we just need darkness, right? But what we need to have is adequate amount of serotonin. And you've probably heard about serotonin being that mood stabilizer, that real keeping you level, keeping you happy. Um, and serotonin uh, needs an amino acid, which is tryptophan. So the first thing I've li listed here is the amino acid tryptophan. Uh, so we need to make sure we've got you know, enough protein in our diet. Uh, so we have the backbone of making serotonin, which then makes melatonin if we apply darkness. So uh, tryptophan, you know, there's certain foods that are high in tryptophan. I've got a link here and I'll go to it because it's a really useful link. I'm hoping uh, you can see me go to this website. Are you seeing the website? Yes, awesome. So myfooddata.com is a really good database, uh, except it keeps sending me ads. <laughs> uh, so here's 
food, you know, it talks about trip to fan, why is it important? You know, stable mood, that's, you know, because it's, again, the uh, backbones of producing uh, serotonin, healthy sleep, again, we need serotonin to produce melatonin. So um, turkey is one of these uh, foods. Um, and then you've got, you know, all, I guess these things that are, you know, are great protein sources, turkey, fish, uh, oats, um, you know, lentils, eggs. Uh, you know, if you continue down, then you get the top foods. Pumpkin seeds are listed here. I'll tell you what, it's smashing me with ads. <laughs> it wants me to buy a car. Um, and, you know, nuts and seeds, uh, talks, you know, it shows you the quantities, how much, the, you know, the RDI is the recommended daily intake. Uh, so having a bit of soy, for example, you know, or 500 milligrams uh, of soy will give you 200% of the RDI. Uh, and you can go down the list, you know, cheese, tryptophan, lamb. And then, so not only it's great for tryptophan, but it's going to be really beneficial for other um you know, micronutrients, uh, such as magnesium, is very important for sleep. So you can go to magnesium. Again, it brings up why magnesium is really important for us. You know, it helps us maintain a healthy nervous function. Uh, nervous function is what drives cortisol production. Um, so we certainly want to be able to regulate our nervous system to help regulate cortisol production. Um, and you know, and it lists all these foods that are really great, high in magnesium. Um, so it's a really helpful resource uh, to have uh, and to go to. So my food data, and you, you know, just go to food list and thinking, look, I'm a bit low in iron. I feel in, the need to increase my iron. Excuse me. Um, again, you can uh, go to iron-rich foods. Um, so some of the supportive micronutrients, um, well, there's also L-theanine that's in uh, green tea uh, is really helpful. You know, so having some green tea during the day can help at night. You don't want to have green tea at night time because it does contain caffeine. But, you know, like a, a green tea during the day will, because uh, L-theanine is really helpful uh, for uh, sleep. Um, and then some of the micronutrients, such as vitamin D, uh, vitamin D, we manufacture that when we're exposed to sun. Um, and then some of the foods that contain vitamin D, uh, you know, salmon, it's the, it's, it tends to be our fatty foods because uh, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, so it'll be found within fats. So, you know, your milks, your cheeses, um, your eggs, and it's the, I guess, the fats of the salmon that contain vitamin D. So it's, you know, the skin, the fatty parts. Um, vitamin Bs, we need our Bs uh, as well. And, you know, the, these are some of the sources where you get your Bs. And I guess generally, you know, by looking at this list, you'll come to the realisation that you need a balanced diet. And so this is why I'm really against these diets that are exclusive, that exclude certain food groups, because it's going to result in nutritional deficiency and it's going to implicate things such as sleep. Um, you know, so I really more for a whole diet um, and not these sort of extreme diets. Uh, they're not, not helpful at all. Um, well that, they're helpful provided you only do them for a short period of time. And, you know, if you're doing keto for weight loss, then it's just doing it for a, a small interval of time and not doing it permanently. Um, so the more better balanced diet for us to have is... Uh, it's again, as I alluded to, it's being it's the balanced approach, uh, and it's really whole in the foods that we would have had a plentiful or in more abundance when we're back in those primate days. Uh, so you know, we're foragers. You know, we used to forage for food, and you know, we'd find nuts and seeds and berries and um, produce uh, around us, leaves and things like that. Um, and then every now and then we'd find some game, which is the meat, but we wouldn't be having meat every day, never. Uh, and this is why intermittent fasting on days of fasting is really beneficial because that's how we've been wired. We've been wired to actually have periods where we're hungry uh, because we haven't found any food. Um, it's, we're in a drought. And so our body help is 
um, familiar with being hungry and sitting with hunger. And so um, in terms of the best diet, it's more of that foraging sort of stuff, less of the, the kill, less of the gain. Uh, and what I have here is a plate and what it should look like. And this two thirds I mentioned here is should be alkalizing. Alkalizing means that when it's broken down, it produces metabolites that are alkalizing to the blood. And the other third is acidic. So you're probably thinking, what's acidic, what's alkalizing? Uh, acidic foods are generally foods that are protein. Um, so protein will tend to break down into metabolites of acid. Your alkalizing foods are things, fruit and vegetables. Uh, and so we really want to have this good balance because this will help maintain our blood at a healthy pH range. And when our blood's in balance, uh, it's, it, everything functions well. Um, so we really want to help the body function well by making sure things are in balance. And this is a good way of doing it. So really eating a lot more plant-based products uh, and that being, you know, lots of fresh fruit and vegetables. Uh, and when you're focusing on that, making sure you're chasing variety, uh, it's whole. Um, you know, we don't want to eat overly processed foods. And there's lots of colour. Uh, so it's that rainbow. We want to be, uh, you know, if we do this, I guess our eating is very simple. <laughs> it's not complicated, you know, it really isn't. Uh, we just need to eat more of how we were meant to eat. Uh, and then, you know, we, we, we do need protein, but we don't need half a plate of protein. Uh, you know, we, a third of the plate of protein is more than adequate for, to meet our protein needs. Uh, so happy to answer any questions around the diet, but, um, you know, so really what's really acidic are our meats and cheeses. Uh, what's really alkalizing is our fruits and vegetables. So when I say alkalizing and acidic, I'm not referring to the taste of it. So some may think lemon's acidic. Actually, lemon metabolizes as, you know, the metabolites of lemon are alkaline. Uh, so uh, it's more your meats, uh, cheeses, saturated fat. So the, you know, the keto diet, for example, is very acid loading um, uh, and you know excessive acid load on our body creates inflammation uh, which can affect our mental health it can you know produce uh, kidney stones uh, you know uric uh, acid um, so uh, we don't want to um, have excessive amounts of acid the western diet has far too much acid in it uh, and we need to get more alkalizing and hence why you're probably seeing more alkaline water come on the market and the benefits people talk about, you know, I just drank alkaline water for three weeks and I feel amazing. Um, you don't need to drink alkaline water for three weeks. You can just simply adopt a more balanced diet and that being more fruit, vegetables, um, whole foods, variety, colour and having meat-free nights, having less animal protein, more plant-based protein, uh, will really take you on a journey of feeling more energetic and really help with sleep. The more inflammation we have in our body, uh, it really affects our body's ability to find balance. And when our body's not balanced, it really affects our ability to sleep. Uh, so the more you have this balanced diet, a uh, balanced body, uh, you know, your body will produce producing the right things at the right time of the day and everything will function or work like clockwork, so to speak. Uh, so I, I don't know how well you can see this, uh, but it, this is highlighting foods that are extremely acidic um, and then uh, foods that are less. So the higher the plus value, the higher acidic producing metabolites it produces, uh, the lower the plus value, the less acidic metabolites. Um, so, um, you know, you can see up here a lot of your meats, your seafoods um, are quite, you know, very acidic. Uh, your more plant products are more alkaline, but you can have your nut butters um, that are quite high acidic. Not saying it's bad, we just need to find that balance. Um, in terms of alkaline, the more negative the value, the higher the alkalizing value it contains. Uh, so 
you can pick out the components of a greens, uh, you know, your green juice, for example, and it's very alkalizing. Um, so, you know, your kale, minus 7.8. Um, you know, you've got uh, you know, a number of things. Cucumbers, you know, cucumbers mildly, um, mildly alkalizing. Um, you know, your avocado is quite high. Um, so you can see here fresh fruit and vegetables. Uh, those that like beer, <laughs> you'll be very excited to know that it's uh, more alkalizing <laughs> as opposed to acidic. Again, it requires moderation. Um, so in terms of alcohol for sleep, uh, some people ask me about alcohol, you know, it helps me wind down. Um, and yes, alcohol can be, it does, it binds to our GABA receptors and GABA uh, does calm the mind. There's other ways in which you can calm the mind too, more resourceful ways, healthier ways. Uh, yes, one standard drink is okay. It's when we go beyond one standard drink, we're really starting to implicate sleep. As much as the more we drink, the more we fall asleep, uh, you probably realise the more you drink, uh, yes, you fall asleep, but you also wake up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep. And there's a reason for that. Uh, because in order to um, break down alcohol, we need some of the key nutrients in order to manufacture the things that we need to sleep. Uh, and those um, resources will be diverted, such as tryptophan, for example. So our body can use, uh, uh, grab tryptophan, the amino acid tryptophan, and make vitamin B3. Uh, vitamin B3 is required to um, break down alcohol along with zinc. Um, and so you can see if we need to break down alcohol, we're going to divert resources to getting rid of alcohol because our body's got no other use for it other than to use it as energy. Uh, so if you want to lose weight, alcohol, you know, drinking alcohol is a no-go uh, because it's highly calorific. It nearly has as much calories as what a gram of fat does. Uh, so it's like having a schooner of fat is what I liken to it in terms of uh, calorific value. Um, it's really, you know, and the higher the alcohol content, the more calories it contains. It's got nothing to do whether it's low carb beer, it's the alcohol content. Um, so the other thing about alcohol, it's a diuretic. So we'll flush out minerals that we need to make sleep neurotransmitters and things to help balance us and stabilize us and relax us such as we'll flush out zinc, we'll flush out magnesium, we'll flush out the water soluble vitamins such as uh, vitamin C, um, our B vitamins. Uh, so we really deplete ourselves of essential vitamins and minerals that we need to sleep and we need to uh, and for energy production as well, because a lot of these are associated with energy production and also managing um, stress uh, and producing stress hormones. So, um, yeah, as much as alcohol may help you fall asleep, I suggest you go to a more uh, sustainable, healthier sleep routine than relying on alcohol. Um, it will, over time, really interrupt your sleep because uh, the, the, the minute the alcohol... What it does is it binds to GABA, it calms the mind, that's the calming effect and while we feel relaxed. But after a couple of hours, it just unbinds to GABA and, uh, and hence we don't have that effect. And that's why we wake up and it's part of the reason why we wake up in the night, um, as well as our body's heavily trying to detoxify um, and why you can't get back to sleep. So it really affects sleep uh, and it really has a great implication in terms of uh, creating nutritional deficiencies by you know, taking away key minerals that we need, key vitamins that we need. And the other thing, it also causes um, issues with our digestive health, uh, which you know, if our digestive health is not functioning well, we can't assimilate the nutrients that we need. So in summary, uh, so we'll have time for questions if you'd like to answer, um, ask some questions. Uh, as I've elaborated intensely on this presentation, I really wanted you to take away that you're trying to work with your body. If you want to work with your body and you know allow it to function well, you need to help balance this seesaw. Um, so we don't want to be doing extreme things, extreme activity, 
uh, extreme dieting, anything extreme really sends the seesaw in one direction. Uh, and it causes a stress on the body and then our body has, it takes time to get it back to the balance. Uh, it's always trying to seek to balance. Um, it's what you know we refer to in medical terms is homeostasis uh, or in scientific terms, it's equilibrium. Our body's always trying to balance. Uh, the more we can help it be in balance, better it rewards us in terms of our moods, our sleep, our health, our vitality. Um, this can be helped and aided with routine. So having that routine, that nightly routine that you stick to night in, you know, or day in, day out, um, will really beneficial, you know, it will reward you. It may, the results may not come overnight because you may need to be doing some rebalancing and you need to allow time for your body to rebalance. But the more you stick with it, um, over time it will reward you and you'll get into this nice sleep routine that you won't want to ruin uh, and you'll realize what it's what an hour difference so going to bed at 10 p.m now going to bed at 11 p.m instead of 10 p.m how much that can really affect your energy the next day um, and just finishing on the point which i've touched on so much it's just being consistent um, consistently <laughs> being consistent with good habits um, so uh, and that's when you'll get rewarded. Uh, it may not happen quickly, but it will happen in time. Uh, and I think the best way to start is start with just one thing, changing one thing. Once you embed that in your routine, it just becomes part of your routine, then go for something else, embed something else. So you could just start with simply having dinner a bit earlier, right? And that's what you focus on for the next month. Once that's in your routine, then you can say, look, I'm going to focus on, I'm going to focus purely on getting to bed at 10 p.m. every night. Uh, and then you'll eventually build up this routine that just becomes so awesome uh, and rewards you that you won't want to go back. So 